so wonderful to have been with you for these past days. Uh, we've been in Scotland for a week, and Lord willing, we'll be returning home tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that. And my wife and our nine, my nine kids are especially looking forward to that, my wife mostly. So uh, thank you for having me here, and it was a delight to be here yesterday, and looking forward to this opportunity to be with you now, and then again this evening. I'm thankful for this church and for the ministry of the IPC, which has many partnerships with our church back in the States and with your pastor, David Gibson, and we've enjoyed his books and we've used them in our Bible studies and other places. So thank you for this faithful ministry here. We're praying for you as you look forward, Lord willing, to moving into your new building. Let's pray as we come to God's Word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Oh Lord, we want to be those blessed men and women, and so may it be so of us that we now would delight in the law of the Lord, as we have just prayed that you would open our eyes, that you would meet us in your word. So give us ears to hear, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text this morning comes from 1 John, 1 John chapter 5. You can follow along as I read 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5. And I appreciate them leaving this nice big pulpit Bible as I was traveling light and brought this little Bible that was better when I was a younger man and not a middle-aged man with my eyes. So God's Word from 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you heard of this phenomenon which has been called the Mandela Effect? The Mandela Effect is when many people collectively seem to have a false memory. It's so named because for some reason, many people, I'm sure not all of you who remember your history well, but many people remember that Nelson Mandela died in prison in the 1980s, and they're quite certain that he died in prison when, in fact, he did not, but was released and became president of South Africa and died in 2013. But scholars have called this phenomenon of cultural misremembering or not noticing something, the Mandela Effect. And you could go Google it later and you can get dozens of examples, some of which seem quite far-fetched, and then other ones you'll say, now wait, I was absolutely certain that was the case. For example, I think you have these here transplanted from America, double stuff Oreos. Did you know that double stuff Oreos only spelled with one F? S-T-U-F, for some reason. Go, you'll be shocked. And if you've ever had double stuff Oreos, you'll wonder why you ever had single stuff Oreos when you can get more stuff. Kit Kat, that candy bar. Think about it, what does it look like? There's no hyphen. Curious George, cartoon little monkey, he has no tail. Did you remember that? How about from Star Wars? Darth Vader's famous line, sorry, spoiler alert, you should have seen it already. Luke, I am your father. Did you know he never says that? He actually says, no, I am your father. Or did you remember that C-3PO is not all gold? He has a silver leg? 
or if you use the, the air freshener spray Febreze, there's only one E in the middle of it. Or if you've seen that famous portrait, I know there's many of them, of Henry VIII, some people have a collective memory that that picture has him eating a turkey leg. Actually, that portrait does not. Or picture on a map, you're all very good at geography, I'm sure, Australia. And where is New Zealand? Where is New Zealand relative to Australia? Many people collectively think it's to the northeast, ah, just up a bit to the northeast of Australia when it is to the southeast. Or how about this one that I just read recently? Think of the color chartreuse. Have you heard of that color? What, what sort of color do you have in your mind with chartreuse? For some reason, I had a kind of magenta, rose, red, pink. It's green. It's yellow green. I know you're saying, Pastor, we knew all of these things. Well, I have missed many of them in Forrest Gump. The movie, Forrest Gump never says life is like a box of chocolates. He says life was like a box of chocolate. The movie Casablanca never has the line, play it again, Sam, on and on and on. Now your mind is blown. You can hardly think of anything else in this sermon. The Mandela effect. We misremember things. And most of those examples are simply the effect of not paying careful attention. See, this is how the mind works. The mind receives information and it immediately begins to not just receive it, but fill in the blanks what it should say. If you've ever seen one of those tests on, online, and it will have a bunch of gibberish looking sentences and you realize it's a sentence or it's a paragraph in English and there's no vowels and there's no breaks between any of the words, but it only takes your brain a few seconds and you look at it and your brain understands what's being communicated. At least if you're a native English speaker, you, the, the vowels aren't there, but your brain fills it in, understands where the words would be broken up. So our brain does the work for us, which is helpful in some instances, but at other times it means that we think we know something that we actually don't know or we haven't paid careful attention to. Our brain has a hard time accepting what it does not expect to be there. Now, I say all of that because if you look at our text, and I hope you'll keep your Bibles open because we'll refer to these verses and some others in 1 John, there are at least three spots in this paragraph that I find particularly surprising because they don't say what we would expect them to say. In particular, if our brains have been somewhat shaped by the Bible and some good theology, we think that John is saying one thing, and if we're not careful, we misread him as saying one thing, when in fact, he says something else. At least three instances where John says something we don't expect to be there. Three surprises. That's what I want us to look at. Here's surprise number one. Verse two. Verse 2 seems to be backward. Look at verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. We expect it to say something like, by this we know that we love God because we love the brothers and we love His commandments. That's what we expect it to say. To move from, how do you know you love God, well, you love the people of God and you love the commandments. But verse 2 goes in the other direction. How do we know we love the children of God? Because we love God and we love His commandments. These three things have a constant interplay in John's epistle. Turn for a minute to 1 John chapter 2. Look at beginning at verse 3. We see over and over again the interplay of these three things, love of God, love of the commands of God, and love of the people of God. So chapter 2, verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. End of verse 5, by this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which we walk. That's what we'd expect. How do you know that you really love God? 
you obey his commandments. Or look later at verse 10 in the same chapter, whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Well, that makes sense. How do you know that you really love your brothers in Christ? Well, you walk in the light. You're an obedient Christian. You have love. Look again at verse 23 in chapter 2. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. All throughout 1 John, we see this kind of movement, obedience, love, belief. These three things work together in John's letter to give us assurance that we are Christians. This is a book, I think, fundamentally about assurance. How do we know that we belong to God? You may be here this morning asking that very question, or perhaps you need to ask that question. How do I know that I'm a Christian? And John's letter gives three very clear indications over and over again, three signs that you are truly a Christian. Now, signs, that language is important. I don't mean what are three things you must do in order to be a Christian, but rather three signs that would tell you that you're on the right road. I appreciate the, the signs. It's more so in, in London than here, but especially where there are going to be lots of uh, ignorant American tourists walking about before you cross the road, it helpfully tells you to look, tells me which way to look because I'm expecting the, the cars to be driving down the right side of the road instead of, shall we say, the wrong side of the road. And so I quite often am looking for cars the wrong way and am thankful for some sort of sign. So if I were driving here, I would be grateful for signs telling me Am I going in the right direction? And so if you want to go up to Inverness or you want to go down to Edinburgh, you will follow the signs and they will tell you, am I on the right path? And so it is, in John's letter, there are three of these signs of assurance. Love for God, love for the people of God, and love for the commands of God. John Stott calls it a theological sign a moral sign, and a social sign. So love for God, what, what you believe about God, moral, how you treat the body of Christ, or rather the commands of God, and then social, how you treat the body of Christ. These three things, you can call it belief, love, obedience, theological, moral, social, love for God, love for brothers, love for commands, however you put it, there are these three things working in interplay throughout John's letter, these three signs over and over. So when we come back now to chapter 5, verse 2, we expect the logic to flow in one direction, from the invisible to the visible. That makes sense. How do you know you love an invisible God? You can't see Him, and you say that you love Him. How do you know you really love this invisible God? Well, you expect the logic to move from invisible to visible, which is how it works at several places in the letter. Okay, you love the invisible God when you show in a visible way that you love other people and that you obey God's commands. But verse 2, surprisingly, moves in the other direction. By this we know we love the children of God. How do you know you are really loving the people of God? And the answer is that you love God and obey His commandments. It moves in the other direction. So it makes sense. How do you know you love a parent? Well, you love their children. But it's also true, whoever loves the child also loves the parent. It moves in both directions. So don't say, well, Kevin, of course I really love you if you don't love my children. No parent feels that you really love them if you don't love their children. And by the same token, how do you know that you really love someone's children 
You can't say, well, I really love <laughs> your kids. It's you I can't stand. You make me absolutely miserable. Well, what sort of love is that for my children if you don't love the father of those children? That's the logic that John is giving to us. If you love the children of God, you will love God and obey His commandments. Now, you could take this as predictive, that is to say, if this is true, then these other two things you can predict will also be true. Love the children of God, you can predict. You also love God and love His commandments. That's one aspect. But I think more importantly, we're meant to take these three things together as a single package. Notice in these verses, verses 1, 2, and 3 mention love. Verses 1, 4, and 5 mention faith. And verses 2 and 3 mention obedience. So love for one another, faith in God or belief, and then obeying God's commands. They're all interwoven, love, faith, obedience. The point is, you are not getting one of those things right if you are not getting the other two things right. So, you can't say, well, I have very good theology and look how much I love God and I am absolutely cruel and heartless to the people around me. Nope, then you don't really understand who this God is. Nor can you say, I love to obey the commands of God, but it doesn't really matter who this God is or how I trust Him. And, John's logic here, you cannot really say, I have such love for God's people, if you don't really obey His commandments and love God. Now, can you see how this may have some explosive application? Most of us have had a conversation at one point with a friend, a relative, a child, who says something to us like this, if you love me, you will accept me for who I am. Why can't you just accept me for who I am? This is my identity. These are the choices I've made. If you really love me, you'll accept me for just the person I am. And usually that statement has something to do with a matter of personal or sexual identity or gender identity often. And sometimes people will tell us, well, yes, we ought to love one another. And love is reduced to unconditional affirmation. That sentence, if you really loved me, you would accept me. That, that definition of love equals unconditional affirmation affirmation. This text tells us something different. John says, don't go around telling each other how much you love them and you're such a church that just loves one another and such great fellowship if you don't actually love God's commands and if you don't actually love God and His Word. This verse, in other words, verse 2, surprisingly reminds us that mere acceptance is not really love, not according to the fullest biblical sense of the term. In other words, we cannot separate love for others from love for God and love for His commandments. Because if you say, oh, I, I love the people of God, but you affirm what is not according to God's Word, you are, in essence, saying, I love you so much, I will put you in my heart above God Himself. Well, how can that truly be love? Love is always ordered rightly, and God must always be the first object of our love. I love you so much, I will find a way to set aside and redefine God's commandments. Verse 2 tells us that's not love. Love is a moral commitment. We love one another truly only when we love in such a way that God may be honored. We can rightly love others only when God holds the right place in our hearts. Say that again. We can rightly love others most fully and deeply only when God holds the right 
place in our hearts. So John would say to many churches in this country and America and all around the world, you boast of being such loving people, love for one another. He would say, okay, that's not love unless you also love God and love His commandments. Because any love you have for the brothers must be a God-directed, according to His Word, love. That's the first surprise. Here's the second surprise. Verse 3. Verse 3, let's be honest, seems unrealistic. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Okay, I get it. But this last part, and His commandments are not burdensome. And all God's people said, yeah, right. (laughs) Really? His commandments are not burdensome? Is that how you view commands? I have yet to have any of my children view any of my commands as not burdensome. The simplest command, could you help watch your younger brother or sister? Could you collect the the garbage before the, the trash man comes, are met with such fainting fits. Oh, Dad, why dost thou persecute us? <laughs> no, when you get a command from parents, teachers, coaches, the government, almost by definition, those commands, all of them feel burdensome, and even from God. Now, here's where we need the Bible to help us interpret the Bible. It is true. The flesh wars against the commands of God. Romans 7, and Paul does the very thing he doesn't want to do. Paul expresses that he at times found the law oppressive. So, there are at work in us ministers of death. But remember, even if you take Romans 7 to be regenerate Paul conflict within himself, that that conflict is, is the, the fleshly part of him that remains. It's the part that's supposed to be put to death. Remember what David said, even in the old covenant, David said, the law of the Lord is what? My delight. I meditate on it day and night. It is sweeter than honey. C.S. Lewis, in one of his essays on Reflections on the Psalms, looks at that and he says, now what a strange thing to say. The law of the Lord is a delight. I could say maybe the law of the Lord is good for me, it will help me, it's true, but a delight? And he says, one of the ways it's a delight is in approaching firmness after you've taken a shortcut that went awry. Uh, w- when I was in uh, school, I ran cross country. You, know, you run a 5K outside, and sometimes you, you, you run in, in the woods. And one time in a practice, I was taking a shortcut. I admit it was a bit of cheating. I've repented for that. It was not very wise because it, it was a shortcut, and it was a very messy shortcut that went through this boggy kind of mire and muck, and it was very obvious on the other side where I had been. And it really wasn't, though it was shorter, it didn't save any time because it was all squishy and muck and mire to get out. And once me and my friend finally got to the other side, back to the pavement, you felt like you could move again because you were hitting something firm, something solid. It was a delight. And so the law is that solidity, that stability. The law, or here, the commands are not meant to be burdensome. I I've, don't mean to footnote myself, but I, I wrote a book recently just to give you the title, Impossible Christianity. And the point of the book is not to say, go out and do impossible things for God, though that's a message appropriate in a certain way, but rather to say, when did it come about that we that we thought that Christianity was meant to be impossible. 
Now listen carefully, I don't mean we can earn our way to God or it's possible to do enough good things that God would love us. No, that's the anti-gospel. We're justified by faith alone. What I mean is this whole path of Christian discipleship somehow, and let's be honest, this can be especially true of Presbyterians, we think the more miserable I feel all the time, the closer I must be to God. The more of a failure I think myself to be, the more I must be really on the right path. Well, it is true that the closer we get to God, the more we see our sin. So the, the, the most advanced saints often feel the farthest from God because they've gotten to see how big God is. But God did not mean for His commandments to be burdensome. Do you believe that you, if you are a born-again Christian, can actually obey the commandments of God? It's not a trick question. Many of us, I think, would him and haw and say, well, I don't know, we never really obey them, do we? Great commission. Make disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded them. Now, I don't know about your Bibles. Does it have a little footnote at the bottom that says, by the way, no one actually can obey any of the things Jesus taught us? Or are we meant to think we can obey them? Paul often bragged about his people and said, like about the Romans, your obedience is known to all. When you have to select elders or deacons, men who are above reproach, don't you find in those qualifications, inevitably you look around and say, yes, there are some men by God's grace who who meet this. So we know instinctively there are godly people who live a life of obedience. One of the distinctions, and maybe this simple distinction will be helpful to you, theologians have often said, we need to distinguish between True obedience and perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. You do it without any flaws, any mixed motives, you n- nothing at all twisted in your heart. Well, of course, that's not going to be true until heaven. But that doesn't mean that you can't truly be obedient to God. We tend to focus sometimes on God only as judge and not on, as father. And if God is only judge... It's a binary choice, innocent, guilty. And okay, the judge doesn't really like me very much, but I know Jesus died for me, I go to heaven at least. He doesn't like me, but he loves me. It's complicated. God is your father, there's a dynamic relationship of of communion. The union with Christ cannot be altered, but that communion, that sense of experiencing his favor can. Some of us imagine God to be a worse father than many of us our fathers. So I have uh, quite a big yard with lots of grass to mow, live outside of the city just a little bit. And so one of the things of good things of having a bunch of kids is they can do stuff for you. And uh, we actually have a, a riding lawnmower and my, my boys don't mind. It's one of the better chores to do. And so if I ask my son, would you go and actually takes several hours, would you go out and and mow the grass? And he does it. Now, inevitably, it's not quite as good as I would do it. The lines, there's some clumps of grass here and there. The lines aren't all straight. It takes a bit longer. Sometimes he doesn't think where he is and the grass blows out onto the sidewalk where I don't want it, all the things. I'm very very particular about this. But if if I tell him to do it, and he gladly, cheerfully does it, and he comes back, what sort of father would I be if an hour or two later I said, son, come with me, come with me. Look, at this is terrible. There's grass everywhere. Let's, let's, let's get out the, the measuring line. You see this? Is this straight? Does this seem straight? I don't think so. I would be a terrible father. Of course, as a, even a sinful father, I say, thank you, son, you did it. Oh, such hard work. I appreciate your obedience. Not perfect, but true, sincere, heartfelt. When believers do what God commands from a heart of faith for the glory of God, God is pleased. 
Look at 1 John 3, verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. There are some dozen times in the New Testament that speak of us pleasing God. I wonder how many of you live a Christian life aware that you can please God. Not just in a, an ultimate justification sense, yes, I'm, I'm simul justus et peccator, I'm a sinner, but I'm righteous. I, I, I would die for that truth. But do you have such an understanding of God as a father and his love for you that one, you can grieve the spirit, you can displease him, but normal, heartfelt, faithful obedience pleases God. One of the reasons, verse 3, back in chapter 5, seems so strange is because we think that God is impossible to please. And so His commandments are burdensome. If some of you had bad parents or you've had a bad boss, someone who just gave you assignments and you knew you could never do a good enough job, a teacher who always gave you a poor mark no matter how hard you worked, well, those commandments are burdensome because you can never please the one who is giving them to you. But God is not like that. Assuming that holiness is out of reach for ordinary Christians does not do justice to the way the Bible speaks. Zechariah and Elizabeth, quote, were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, Luke 1, 6. Blameless there doesn't mean perfect, complete, sinless obedience. It means a regular pattern of faithful obedience. Or the Lord's commendation of Job, quote, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Some of us think that God is always irksome, austere, peevish. Now, you may say, well, what about Isaiah 64, 6, all of your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Well, we don't have time to, to look at it in detail, but you can go and study it sometime. And I submit to you that many of us, and I'm sure I did in years past, have misunderstood and misapplied that verse. Because you can read in the context the righteousness Isaiah is talking about are God's people who are offering sacrifices as if that would please God, and then they go and they live out among the tombs and they don't keep the food laws. It's a perfunctory obedience. That's the righteousness that is a filthy rag. It would be like Isaiah today would say, you get dressed up for church and you put something in the collection plate and then you're an absolute monster to your family and you swindle from your employer. Yeah, your Sunday righteousness is a filthy rag. Isaiah 64 is not about heartfelt, sincere obedience. Isaiah 64 Five goes on to talk about a righteousness that actually is a joy before the Lord. Righteousness is not a filthy rag when it is done from a sincere heart according to God's commands. Christians can be rich in good works, 1 Timothy 6.18. We can walk in a way worthy of our calling, Ephesians 4.1. Looking upon our good works in His Son, Here's what Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16, says, quote, God is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. As is often the case, our forefathers in the faith understood this more carefully and put down for us the right theological parameters. Notice the Westminster Confession says those good works are accepted in the Son. It's, it's an act of grace. They have many weaknesses and imperfections, and yet God is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere. Don't try to be more reformed than the Westminster Confession of Faith itself. So that's the second surprise. Now quickly, the third surprise, verse 4. Verse 4 seems over the top. 
This is the victory that has overcome the world. Now, here's what you expect it to say. Shouldn't it say, Christ, this is the victory. Jesus on the cross, this is the victory. God in heaven, or this is the victory. The work of the Holy Spirit. But it says, this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Oh, John, isn't that a bit over the top? Our faith. Verse 5 tells us the one who overcomes the world is the one with faith, the one who believes. The book of Revelation is in one way really easy to understand, really easy to understand. And I'll help you remember it because some of you, I'm trying to look, maybe some of you, you have the book of Revelation on your feet. Because the word in Revelation that is the centerpiece is the word Nike. Some of you, you you got at home, you got a little swoosh there, you have a Nike shoe. The Greek word Nike means victory. Nikao means to overcome or to conquer. And those seven letters in Revelation, also written by John, to the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers, to the one who has victory. The book of Revelation is about how to be an overcomer instead of a succumber. And so here, the one who has victory, the one who overcomes, the one who conquers is the one who has faith. Three times he speaks of overcoming in verses 4 and 5. So we are meant to be victorious Christians. Now here we, have, we must allow that the Bible speaks of important truths in different ways. Uh, ask you this question. Are Christians supposed to be characterized by strength or weakness? Well, you can make a case for both according to the Bible. Weakness, Paul boasts in his weakness. But don't miss it. Paul in weakness, he doesn't mean we're weak because I sin a lot and I'm, I, I'm disordered. No, he's weak in that he suffers and he's wholly dependent upon God, and he doesn't have all of the the credentials that people want him to have in the world, that is weakness. But we also see the Bible say Christians are strong. They're victorious. We are not meant to live a life of spiritual failure. Some of us have thought that that's really the high mark of spirituality. A kind of, as one person called it, ecstatic failureism. No, we are meant to be victorious. Now, it's true, we reach the end of ourselves, we turn to Christ, so failure in that sense can be a good thing. But if we are true Christians, those who inherit eternal life, we must be overcomers. And think about what Paul's, or rather John's statement is saying. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Now, if you just step back out of a Christian context and ask someone, where, is the, where would you locate the victory that overcomes the world? Where are you going to go and find world-conquering victory? Uh, Rome? Washington, D.C.? London? Beijing? New York City? That's where we might expect to find the victory that overcomes the world. John says, no, not at all. It's in you. Your faith. By faith, we are victorious. Isn't that the point of Hebrews 11, that famous chapter, the hall of fame of faith, all of those men and women commended through faith. Their life and work Though imperfect saints was representative of what was good and true and commendable. So by faith, we have victory. And John is also saying faith itself is the victory. Here's what I mean. If you are facing a cancer diagnosis and you're scared, understandably, there's things to be afraid of. You're fearful. You wonder how God could be doing this to you and to your family. 
you're facing injustice at school, somebody in your own immediate family has, has betrayed you, and you wonder what in the world could God be doing. And, and just as you're, you're ready to curse God, you fight back that temptation and you say, no, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? I believe that God loves me and he can never leave me nor forsake me. What is that? That faith right there, the faith itself, that's the victory. You did not renounce God. You did not turn your back on Christ. Or perhaps for you, it's, it's the overwhelming, crushing sense of, of guilt, places you've been, secrets you're hiding, even now, things you've looked at on your computer screen just this week that you shouldn't have looked at. And the devil wants to accuse you and tell you to give up and give in. But you claim the promises of Romans 8. No, 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 there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you plead with God from Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And you put away what is impure. What is that? That's victory. And faith is the victory, to believe the promises of God against the lies in your own heart and the lies of the world and the lies of the devil. The key to everything in this passage and really in this whole book is that you and I must be born again. Do you see that? Faith, love, obedience, they follow from a birth that comes from above. I said at the beginning, these three signs or these three tests, love for God, love for the people of God, love for the commandments of God, they are all tied to the new birth. Look again at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Verse 4, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. New birth regeneration, that is what makes all of this victorious Christian life possible. So I don't want you to misunderstand and think this is a self-help message, go out and be the best version of you. Rather, all of these things, obedience, love, faith, these are all not causes of the new birth, but consequences of the new birth. The reason commandments are not burdensome for us is not only because of the nature of the commands, but because we have been given a new nature. What once felt oppressive has become freeing. What inspired dread in us is now a delight so that we can truly believe Jesus when he says, my yoke is what, easy? And my burden is light? Now, you carry a cross, we're willing to suffer, but the Christian life is meant to be a burden that is light. So here's two final words I leave you with. If this is all about everything as a consequence flows from our new birth in Christ, there's two ways to take this, as a warning and as an encouragement. Think about the new birth. Here's the warning. Are you? Are you this morning born again? Have you been given new life in Christ? You say, well, what do I do to be born again? Well, in one sense, you can do nothing. But if God, even this morning, is speaking to you and you hear His voice, you can bow in your heart and pray and ask God that He would give you more light and grace, and that itself would be a sign of His new birth in you. So a warning when we think about the new birth, are you? But here's the encouragement if you're a Christian. You are. Warning, are you? Encouragement for the Christian, you are. That's the point of this book. The born-again Christian has been changed. The change is stumbling, it is imperfect, it is full of temptation and struggle, but the change is real heartfelt, discernible, and in the end, victorious. Let that be your confidence, 
your courage and your great encouragement this day. Who is it that overcomes the world? It's people like you who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give grace for Your Word, for all Your many precious promises, and we pray that You would now preach them to our hearts by Your Spirit throughout this day and this week, that we might be born again if we are not, and if we are, we would have great hope to know that Your commandments are freeing and that life in Christ is joy and that You, our Heavenly Father, are easily pleased. We pray in Christ our Lord. Amen.